My name is Erin McKinley. I am the Reader Engagement Manager here. I am actually outside today. Um, and it was very fitting for our gardening with wildlife conversation. Um, just so that everyone is reminded, we are all muted here to allow John and Joan to have a free flowing conversation. If you guys do have any questions that you didn't get a chance to submit beforehand, go ahead and use that Q&A function on the Zoom toolbar. Um, if you wanted to say hi, just go ahead and drop us a little note in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but really with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started with today's conversation to allow uh, enough time for, for questions and, and some really good conversation. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce to you guys, uh, Joan Morris. She is our garden writer and animal life writer. So Joan, I know you had about a, a 15 second break, uh, but uh, welcome and uh, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and welcome to all the people that are joining us now on the, uh, this webinar. We're going to talk today about uh, finding ways to uh, be able to have a garden and a yard without too much interference from um, wildlife. Um, I am, as Erin said, the Pets and Wildlife columnist and garden writer for the Bay Area News Group. Um, I've been with the paper for more than 30 years. Um, and I'm probably new to gardening. I've probably only been doing that about 40 or 50 yet. <laughs> uh, you never get to be um, as proficient as you'd like. But uh, joining me today is John Fike, who is a Contra Costa Master Gardener. Uh, we lovingly call him the bug guy because he knows a lot about insects. Uh, but his background is not maybe what you would think it would be for somebody that is knowledgeable about insects. But John, um, introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Joan. Well, um, I, by formal training, I am a biologist. And um, when I was a young man, I was fascinated with entomology, which is bugs, and herpetology, which is reptiles and amphibians, and all, all the field sciences. I subsequently went into the medical field, um, but I always had a fascination about the basic biology that surrounds us. And when I retired, uh, I became a master gardener. It allowed me to embrace those aspects of biology that I loved as a young man. And I, I like to interact with the public and to educate, I hope, a little bit about uh, the, the, the biology around us. And I hope to get people as enthusiastic about bugs as I am. And that's why my wife thinks I'm completely nuts. But I love <laughs> bugs. And uh, I hope we can talk a little bit about bugs as well as some of the other critters that impact our ecosystem. Joan? Yeah, that's great. Um, I thought we'd start today and talk a little bit about um, gardening with uh, the idea of keeping nature in balance. And to me, that means that um, you have to set a limit to what you're willing to accept in the way of damage or loss. You're never going to have a pristine, perfect garden. I mean, even the Garden of Eden had a snake, right? So. Um, when you're deciding on you know, what you can tolerate, then that leads to what you can do as far as control is. Um, John, I know that, that you're also a big believer in uh, gardening with, in balance. So what are some of the things that you would do uh, to make sure that you don't throw nature out of balance? Well, um... As you said, you have, there's a, a lot of elements to that, one of which is a tolerance, as you said, that, that how much damage can you, uh, uh, can you accept and still be, be happy with? And um, nature has found uh, or has developed ways to deal with pests. And now I'm talking about the insect pests more than the vertebrate pests. Um, I always like to say that there are, Smithsonian estimated there are 10 quintillion insects alive. That was a couple of years ago. That's a billion billion. Put it in a perspective that's kind of bizarre, but interesting that for every pound of human being on earth, there are 300 pounds of insects. 
That's you a just lot gave of, everybody the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I do in my insect talk, I, I, I do a little thing for my weight. That's equivalent of 28.5 tons of insects. So, and that's a lot of bugs. And many of them are pests. But what have we done as humans then uh, to deal with this while well, we develop chemicals? Uh, and there are many, Joan, you and I are of the age that we remember DDT. There's probably others out that remember DDT, a really effective insecticide, but it killed everything. And so um, there's a lot of chemicals out there, and, but nature has come up with ways to combat the pests without chemicals. And that's by using beneficial insects. And there's lots of them out there. Does that mean you won't have pests? No. It doesn't mean it, but there are a lot of insects out there that we consider beneficial. The ladybug, the lady beetle that we all know and love is the, is the gold standard for um, a, a beneficial insect. There's lots of beetles and flying insects that are our friends. And so what do we do uh, to enhance this? Well, we grow flowers, for instance, because many of the beneficial insects, the adults, eat pollen or nectar, but their babies eat aphids and other pest insects. So you want to have your environment. And so it's a win-win for us, I think. You want beautiful flowers that brings in the beneficials and they help take care of the bad guys. This year has been an amazing year in my yard for aphids. I've never seen so many aphids in my life. And um, I don't do any chemicals at all. I spray them off or knock them off, but all of a sudden, the beneficials came in and in a matter of days, they just eradicated most, not all. I have a, I, I told you, Joan, when we went through this the other day, I have a little homework assignment for everyone who's listening in. If they could go out in their garden today after this, if you have flowers in your garden and you just in there and watch for a minute and you will see a little fly it's called a hover fly or a serpent fly. And they're like little helicopters. They, they hover over the, over the plant. They look like a little bee because they're uh, uh, yellow and black, but they're a fly. And they hover and then they dart away and hover again. And they eat pollen, the adults, and they lay their eggs. And they, the babies are called larvae and they're a little green worm that is a voracious eater of aphids. And if you have aphids on your roses right now or any other plant, go take a look and you'll see little green worms in there with them. And those guys are taking care of the aphids. And so it's, if you can stand a few aphids, uh, the, the good guys will come in and take care of them. And I think that's the balance we want is because you, you don't need to use chemicals. Now that does not mean that, that you won't lose some fruit, you won't lose some, some lettuce to worms or to aphids, but it'll, it'll really have a significant effect and you'll get most of what you need and you won't have to put any nasty chemicals or anything in your garden. And I really push that. I think it really worked. I've, I've tried it for the last two years because talk's cheap, but I actually did it. I sit there and go, okay, I'm not gonna do anything except spray water on aphids and do these things. I'm not gonna use anything and see what happens. And it's been remarkable. And it, it takes a little time and you have to watch, but if you get out there and see what's happening, it's fascinating. And I think uh, it, it's healthy because if you spray something like a broad spectrum insecticide, you're not only killing the bad guys, you're killing all these good guys. And there are good guys that you can hardly even see, little wasps and things, I won't go into that, which are just amazing of how they can control aphids and scales and white flies and all these things that we consider pests. Long answer to your question. <laughs> Well, that's basically, you know, what we promote is integrated pest management, which we we realize that there are conditions and concerns where you do have to use pesticides or insecticides, but we want that to be your last resort. Uh, look for the non-lethal ways first, uh, whether it's for aphids, spraying them off with the hose or just picking them off with your fingers. Um, because you do run such a risk that, yeah, you'll kill the aphids, but you'll kill the beneficials. And that 
eventually allows the aphids to return in greater numbers because now there's no beneficials that are there to uh, control them. And it's the same way with um, the vertebrates too. You don't, um, you don't wanna wipe out an entire species. First of all, you can't. There are so many animals. Uh, well, I guess you could, but let's, let's try not to do that. Um, but, you know, if you get rid of all the rats, then the hawks don't have as much to eat or, you know, to feed on. And so it's, you have to think beyond just that, that creature or that pest um, to, you know, other natural ways. If you let them live, then another animal that preys on them will then, you know, be able to live off them. Um, so a lot of uh, ways of controlling both insects and uh, the mammals or, or furry critters is through exclusion. Um, first of all, you wanna make sure that your yard is not inviting in creatures. Um, like someone has just asked about the rats. Um, if, you, if you have places for them to live, you have food and water source for them, of course they're gonna live with you. That's what rats do to begin with. They are the only uh, wild animal that I'm aware of that depend on humans for their existence. They're commensal, they live with us. And apparently always have, it's not like they came in from the jungle. But, um, so you wanna get rid of places where they can hide or they can live in and breed. Um, that might mean removing a ground cover where they could um, hang out. Uh, someone asked about whether ceanothus would be considered a problem. Um, not unless it's um, you know overgrown and wild. That's you know where the rats can hang out. Um, under your deck, which rats, skunks, possums, any kind of critter, they love under decks because they're quiet dark places, they can raise their families there. And um, it might not be a problem, but if you have skunks and you have a yappy little dog like I do, it can be a problem. So um, basically you want to make sure that your yard is, is nice for you, but it's not welcoming to other critters. And it's better for the critters too, to live uh, elsewhere, not too close to Jason. Um, a lot of people get very upset when they hear this. And if you follow my column, I'm sure you already know that when it comes to trapping uh, animals like raccoons or possums or any of those, that state law says you have two options. You release it on your property, which many people think is insane, or you kill it. And there's prescribed ways of killing humanely. I don't. I'm not familiar exactly what those are because I don't want to kill anything. But um, the reason for releasing them where they were caught is not to just make it a game. Um, it, when, once you trap it, you want to seal off the area where they were living so they can't get back. But if you take it down the street to a park, first of all, you're transferring your problem to somebody else's house or yard. Um, you might be moving the animal into another animal's territory, which pretty much dooms um, the animal that you've located. So in effect, you've killed it anyway. Uh, they may not know where food and water sources are at this new place that you've dumped them out. If they were diseased, they can now spread that disease to another population. And especially this time of year, if they have offspring, you've now deprived the offspring of um, a parent and a source of food. So, I mean, they bring food to the, to the baby. So it's just not a good idea to relocate. And that's why the law is written that way. Um, we would talk a little bit about what works and what doesn't when it comes to um, uh, trying to exclude animals or drive them out of your yard. Someone asked about ground squirrels, which 
anybody knows me knows brown squirrels were the bane of my existence. When we first started our garden, I didn't realize that in the field behind where the garden was at the uh, former Contra Costa Times office building, there was a huge colony of ground squirrels. And boy, were they happy when we moved in. We planted a garden on a Friday and on Monday, it had been eaten to the ground. And we tried everything to control ground squirrels. We tried uh, the chemical deterrent, they just used them to season the food that they were eating. We tried a short fence with prongs, which we were told would work and did not. We tried uh, bird netting, which was very successful at keeping humans out of the garden, but it didn't do anything against the squirrels. And we finally found the only solution was a, an electric fence. It's a shock wire, it's not really, it doesn't electrocute them. Um, and a lot of men that worked at the paper asked me if they could go out and touch it for some reason. I don't know why. But um, it just provides a really strong shock. And that's the only thing that we found that would keep them out. We also had to bury the fence two feet down, which is pretty much the maximum that they'll burrow to get under the fence. But we had huge success with that. We now have it at our not that new anymore, but at our new location, uh, we also installed it there. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of expense to put up a fence. But if you want to garden and you're plagued with ground squirrels, or if they're uh, burrowing under your house and chewing up wires and pipes and stuff, it's really been worth it, worth the investment to do that. Uh, with gophers, a lot of people, I always hear, oh, we put spearmint chewing gum in the hole and that took care of them. If it did, it was pure coincidence because any type of gum is not gonna do anything to the gopher uh, to deter it. Those uh, stakes that they sell that got an ultrasonic sound, it might bother them at first, but they quickly get used to it. So that doesn't drive them out. Uh, flooding the tunnels doesn't, do it because once they sense water or if you use uh, gas exhaust from your car, they just fill up the tunnel. They're very quick, fill up the tunnel, and then they retreat into a deeper recess and dig more tunnels. So the only thing that works, unfortunately, is uh, trapping and that kills them. And it's not easy. I, I, Personally, don't want to be responsible for killing any creature, but um, if that's your only solution and you can't live with the damage, and I don't blame you if you can't, then uh, lethal trapping is the only way to deal with it. So um, that's kind of our speeches on uh, <laughs> balancing gardening. Let's get to some of our questions. And we had quite a few submitted, so I'm going to try to start with them first. Um, and this one I'm going to send to John because um, it's from Peg, who says, earwigs in everything. Currently, the problem is potato plants and beets in the garden. So um, Jess has gophers in her yard that she's controlling with a gopher hawk trap. That's the mm -hmm. brand. And she's got rats eating strawberries and tomatoes um, that she's she's using rat traps for those. But let's talk about the earwigs first. Earwigs, earwigs are, are a problem. They're, you know, but what's an interesting thing about earwigs is everybody uh, dislikes or hates them because they are obnoxious little guys. But you know, they're actually have some good things too. They love to eat aphids. But having said that, they are, particularly rough on young plants. And um, there are ways to deal with them. Uh, on the UCIPM um, website, which there's a handout or will be sent to people. Um, and on the earwig site, they give you uh, all the various ways you can trap them. Um, first of all, try to keep things away from the base of your little plants, things where they can hide. Water in the morning, so it'll dry out in the evening. 
they like to where it's a little bit damper, a little more humidity. Um, you can trap them with things, simple things, a rolled up newspaper. They'll crawl into that and then you just take the newspaper and either shake it out into some uh, soapy water or throw it away. You could put out a length of hose or some bamboo uh, pieces that have whole, you know, the hollow. They crawl into that. And the same thing, you could take a piece of hose and then shake it out over the, the soapy water and, and do that. There is um, a uh, insecticide that is, it's organically approved, which means it's good for organic gardening, but that doesn't, it's still an insecticide. It's called spinosad or spinosad. And it um, uh, combined with iron phosphate, uh, which is a snail bait, this is, uh, uh, earwigs will eat this and, and die. Um, there, you can find that. It's, it's called Sluggo Plus, and it's on the IPM website, so I can mention that specific one. Um, and it is effective against snail slugs and earwigs. But uh, try the trapping. Uh, try to keep things away from the base of the plant. Once the plants get to a certain size, I couldn't tell you exactly what size that is. Um, while they can cut little holes and chew the egg, the plant will survive. But when they're little, um, earwigs can be very damaging. And But those trapping methods, the one that's actually is a good one, you take a, a, a cat food can or a tuna can or something like that. Um, you fill it with a half an inch of oil. Don't use your good expensive olive oil, but just use some, uh, some corn oil or something. And you bury the can to, to ground level. And you put maybe something stinky like, like tuna or fish oil or something along the edge. And the earwigs will come and fall, crawl into the uh, can and they'll die in the oil. And that is an effective uh, um, trap. I don't know if you want to have little cans around your plants, but at least while they're little, uh, while the plants are little, that can be a very effective deterrent against the earwigs. But uh, keep uh, working with it and be vigilant. And uh, I actually had a person at a farmer's market table who uh, said they went out at night with a flashlight and a pair of scissors and cut the earwigs in half. Now, I wouldn't encourage that. It's, it's pretty labor intensive, but I guess you could say it's effective. But you just have to keep after them, and eventually the plants will grow to a size, and they'll survive them. Yeah, it's a good reminder too to keep a close eye on new seedlings because I bought some last year, two years ago, and wasn't quite ready to plant. But I had them outside, and I practically overnight half of them had been destroyed, and I thought it was birds at first because those earwigs were sneaky come out at night when you're not and you don't see them but I finally discovered it was the earwig so um and just briefly I'll talk about the rats eating strawberries and tomatoes uh the first step of course is to look around your yard and see if there's things that are attracting the rats they don't need much of an invitation to come into your yard but if you can get rid of those that's like the first step uh otherwise you need to uh, Look at fencing, either um, with chicken wire, the small chicken wire or hardware cloth or something that you can surround your plants with that will physically keep them out. Uh, if you're trapping, as I mentioned uh, in the earlier session, I found that the most effective way of trapping is to use half a walnut that you tied with dental floss or super glued it on to the trigger of the rat trap so that the rat actually has to pull on it or tug on it, uh, which will trip the trap and you're more likely to have a clean kill. Um, again, you may have, hate rats, but you don't want them suffering. And please do not ever use poisons. Uh, they're very cruel. Um, they cause the rats to basically dry up from the inside out. They suffer a lot. Uh, they'll head out for water and while they're out, they can be easy prey for um, hawks or um, other birds of prey, cats, um, pets, and then that poison gets passed on. So you don't wanna do that. Um, the next question is from Karen Hunt. He says, we've enjoyed the variety of birds that flock to our feeders, especially during the past year. We provide the so-called no-waste seed in long tubes 
nests with trays underneath. Still, a lot of seeds hit the ground. The squirrels do a pretty good job of eating what is dropped, but at dusk, we recently saw a rat, and I have a skunk family that may have taken up residence under our deck. What should we do short of removing the feeders? Should I have a humane trapper relocate the skunk? What can be done about the rats that won't harm other animals? Well, we've already talked about the rat trap uh, and no poison. If you hire somebody to remove, uh, to trap and remove the skunk, they may tell you that they're relocating it, but odds are they'll just take it and euthanize it or kill it. So you, you probably don't wanna do that. Um, skunks can be a little destructive in the yard, um, I'm willing to tolerate them, except that I have a yappy dog and I don't want uh, him to get stuck. So um, you want to block the deck so that the skunks can't get there, but you need to make sure first that there's not some babies living under there. If there are, you want to leave it open until they leave or old enough to leave. And one way to know is to um, at dusk or slightly before dusk, spread some flour, uh, baking flour in front of the entrance hole where you think the entrance hole is, and then check for footprints leading out. Once you know that they're out, you can then seal up the deck because you do not want to seal up any animal under your deck, but you especially don't want to seal up um, as far as the bird feeders go, you can try buying a brand uh, of seed that's called No Mess. <coughs> it is more expensive, slightly. But a lot of bird seed that you buy has um, filler in it, millet and other seeds that the birds aren't as crazy about, so they throw it out to get to find the good stuff. And that's why you have so much spillage. So it won't eliminate it completely because you know birds aren't dainty eaters, but it will reduce it. And um, you can also install uh, trays beneath the seed feeders that catch the spillage. <clears throat> the ground feeding birds, the pigeons and other ground feeders will come up on that platform and eat the seed there. <coughs> but it keeps it off the ground. Then you wanna make sure that the rats can't access the feeders or that tray. And that may mean moving the feeder away from areas where that rats can jump onto it. Um, poles, putting them on top of poles is good because they can't climb, rats can't climb the poles. And um, you can also, they sell baffles, which are big, plastic, round plastic things that go on top of the bird feeder, or also you can put them beneath, but that keeps uh, them from coming in from the top. They can't reach under it. So any thoughts on that, John? Before we uh, move on? You know, I just had something about the skunks uh, and I'm not encouraging people to, you know, the skunks have pretty bad body odors, we know. But you know, skunks are interesting because they'll eat rats and they'll eat mice and um, and they dig up yellow jacket nests and eat the yellow jackets. And so, you know, you look at it from a different perspective. While they, you know, certainly are, are, are a pest and they stinky, but if you can tolerate that, if you have a big enough place and they're not really right in your face, so to speak, they can do some positive things. I always wonder that, you know, if somebody says, I have this skunk in the backyard that's driving me crazy, you want to ask, well, do you have any rats too? And it's just an interesting perspective and a different way to look at, at uh, the interactions of the various creatures in the, in the, the garden. And I, I think it's, uh, like I said, I'm not encouraging anybody to, uh, to foster a place for a, a skunk habitat in your backyard, but it's just an interesting way to think about uh, what we consider pests because they have some good qualities to them as well. Of course, skunks have some negative ones. They also carry rabies 
and that can be a very dangerous thing to us and our pets. So there's a, there's a, uh, you have to weigh it, both the pluses and the minus on them. Yeah. Someone uh, just noted in the chat that skunks eat slugs and snails. So yeah. that's also another benefit. Uh, possums do that also. Um, we have a lot of um, kind of repetitive questions that talk about uh, ask about rats and gophers. I think we've perhaps answered those. Um, I do have a question here from someone that asked about how to tell whether you have a gopher or a mole. Um, it's not, I mean, I can tell you, but it's not always as simple as <clears throat> seeing it or, you know, figuring it out. But the gopher mounds are horseshoe shaped or crescent shaped with the hole offset or in the center, offset. Um, and the mole mounds are almost perfectly symmetrically round and the entrance hole, which is usually blocked, is in the center. Uh, <clears throat> some moles leave huge tunnels and some just do small ones. So it's not always easy to tell. The moles are burrowing around looking for insects. They don't eat your plants. They might accidentally destroy a plant if they dislodge uh, the soil around the roots, but they don't eat the plant. Gophers eat the plant. So if <clears throat> you're seeing a lot of loss in plants, um, especially new plants, and you, you have the tunnels and the, um, the mounds, then <clears throat> you probably have a gopher. Um, and kind of along those lines, someone else um, had written about one of their trees all of a sudden is dying and they found pieces of bark lying around it. And I'm going to assume that um, there's a, the bark was removed from the bottom ring of the tree. And that is likely a bowl. They chew on bark and they basically gird the tree. They strip the bark all the way around. And so that's likely what you have is a bowl. Um, they do live underground, but they don't do extensive tunneling. And you're likely also to find in the grass um, tracks or runs, places where the grass is either worn away or packed down. Um, and that's, they tend to uh, go in the exact same route every time. So they create these um, pathways. Um, bulls, the population is cyclical. Some years it's very high and most years they're practically non-existent. And I'm not sure what year we're having, what kind of year we're having this year. But I'm going to guess it's, it's a bold year. Um, I've had a lot of people writing about them, asking me about them. So um, you want to keep foliage cut down around trees so that it doesn't provide cover for the bowl. Um, and also so that you can see any damage when it starts so that you can stop it. And bowls are fairly easy to trap. You just use a mouse trap. You don't even have to bait it but you put it in the pathway, uh, one going this way and one going that way. So you get them coming or going and um, they just run right into the trap or intent that way. But that, that will help you get rid of the, uh, the bowls. Um, Sandra Malloy says, I love spiders, not as wild for the six-legged creatures. Um, I get upset, well, not really upset. I'm puzzled, I guess, by people that get so frightened of spiders. Um, they're, they're little tiny things. They don't even, they don't drink blood. They don't eat us. <laughs> it's like, you know, us being next to Godzilla. I don't think Godzilla is gonna be afraid of us and we shouldn't be afraid of spiders. They aren't nearly as sneaky as people like to think they are. They don't lie in wait waiting for you to go to bed so they can 
creep onto you and bite you. Um, maybe John knows, I have heard that a lot of so-called spider bites are actually mosquito bites that takes a while before you start itching. And so, you know, you might get bit in the afternoon or the evening when mosquitoes are out more. And the next morning's when you discover it. And so you just assume that the spider has bit. What do you know about spiders, John? Well, uh, I think the fear of spiders, I, um, uh, I won't go into my own bias, but uh, this fear of spiders, I think, arises from things like the black widow, which is a poisonous spider. There's no doubt that that one is potentially dangerous. It's about the only one in Northern California. In Southern California, they have the brown recluse, which is a, a poisonous spider. But I think that's probably where the fear of spider comes from. Uh, and they're, they have a creep factor. They're little creepy things, especially the black widows. But um, I always like to say in my, uh, when I give this uh, a talk on it, that, that spiders worldwide eat 400 to 800 million tons of prey. That's more weight than the human, the adult human population on earth. That's pretty astounding if you think about it. And you think, I mentioned earlier about how many insects there are. Um, spiders do a great service for us. I mean, they're amazing at, at cleaning up uh, insects, both the good insects and the bad. But I think people need to put it in perspective. And I'm talking to myself too, because I have a little bias. I, I can pick up rattlesnakes and things like that, but the spiders give me more of the creeps. And, and, but yet they are really a very beneficial organism uh, to have. And, and I, I agree with you. I think we, people just have this irrational fear that, that they're, they're gonna jump on you and bite you and stuff. I don't know too much about spider bites per se. I don't know how many spiders actually will bite a human. Most of them are, even if they do, they're not, they're not a dangerous bite. But having said that, I don't know how common it is to get bitten by a spider. I get bites in the yard uh, now and then, but I have, I have no clue. Uh, in, in the South, they call them no see -ums. You don't know what got you. Um, so it could be a spider, but I, I don't know. But don't be so afraid of spiders. I'm talking to myself too. <laughs> I think you have to work at getting a spider to bite you because... Uh, they don't want anything to do with us, but if we, at night, if we roll over on them, you know, they're going to defend themselves. Or if you're working in the yard and you reach into a dark, creepy hole and you get bit, it's because you were attacking them. Yeah. Um, Cynthia Wetmore, I believe is the name, writes um, that she has a huge aphid problem and she got some ladybugs and they stayed around for a while, but now most are gone and they are still aphids. Um, and asking about other suggestions. Well, um, unfortunately, I, I think you know people buy ladybugs um, and they're they're fun for kids to see them, but ladybugs are going to fly away and they're going to go to where even if you have aphids, they're going to go somewhere else mainly but there are a lot of ways you can deal with aphids they're real they're obnoxious and there's lots of them and the reason there's lots of them this is a little biology for you for people who care um that um aphids female aphid does not need a male aphid uh to uh, reproduce they're it's called parthenogenesis they are able to reproduce by themselves and they give birth to live young, which is somewhat rare for insects. And most all of the live young are females, which in five to seven days are ready to give birth to more live females. So that's why you get this explosion of aphids. Now, you can do a number of things that are easy. You can strip them off with your hand. You can, uh, one of the most common things is to just blow them off with water. Uh, and once the aphids hit the ground, they won't crawl back up. Now, but some aphids fly, of course, they're pregnant, off you go again. So it's a constant problem. If it's, uh, I'll go to the beneficials in a minute, but if it is absolutely intolerable, if your tolerance level of aphids, and I've run into people at markets that say that, they just can't stand it. So what's your next step? Well, then you can use things like oil, uh, horticultural oil, neem oil. There's various uh, safe, relatively safe oils that will suffocate the aphids. Uh, and they're pretty harmless in terms of the environment. They're harmless to you, it's harmless to your pets. It will kill beneficials possibly. 
So you have oils that will suffocate the aphids. If you don't like that, there's insecticidal soaps that you can buy that do the same thing, they suffocate the aphids. I would encourage you to uh, physically try to take them off of your plants and then let the beneficial insects come in. If you don't see um, lady beetles, there are other insects that take over. And I said this in, in our earlier session, there's a thing called a serpent fly. It's called a hover fly. It's a little tiny fly. It looks kind of like a bee because it's striped black and yellow, but it hovers like a helicopter over the plant. And if you go out in your garden today, you'll find them. I guarantee you, I find, I, they're all over my garden right now. And what they do, the adults eat pollen. And uh, so they're very harmless. And they lay their eggs and their, uh, their eggs hatch into what's called a larva. It's like a little green maggot. And it eats aphids like crazy. And uh, they are all over my yard now. And when I go out and look at my aphids, if you have aphids today, I can't remember your name, I'm sorry. But go out today and look at closely. Go down there and look at the aphids. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see a little green worm in there with them. And that little green worm is eating them. And they eat them voraciously. And uh, you can go. For, that doesn't mean you won't have an aphid in your yard. But it'll really reduce them. Uh, it's remarkable. I've seen it in my own yard uh, this year. And there's other things. There are little tiny wasps. And uh, when I say wasp, most people think of yellow jackets or something that'll sting you. These wasps are less than a quarter inch in size. They're tiny. They lay their eggs inside of an aphid. The egg hatches, the larva develops, and the whole life cycle of the wasp takes place inside an aphid. Think about how small an aphid is. And an adult wasp will emerge from that dead aphid. And it's remarkable. I had aphids last year uh, in, the, in the fall on my, a pepper plant and I was going nuts. And I went there a few days later and I looked and I turned over the leaf and there were what they called aphid mummies. They're dead aphids with little holes in them where the uh, wasp camp, the wasp completely obliterated the aphid population. So you've got a whole uh, family of beneficial insects that will take, help you take care of the aphids. But go out there and knock, knock them off and, and use, sorry, it's a doorbell. I'm sorry about that if you heard <laughs> it. Um, but uh, let the beneficials help you out. But go out and wash them off because I know they can be very obnoxious, but there are ways to do it. Uh, and there are ways, if you have to use a pesticide, there are relatively non-toxic ones. We always say with the integrated pest management, if you have to use a pesticide, use the least toxic available. And those are, for aphids, those are oils and soaps. Stay away from the broad spectrums, the malathions of the world, the organophosphates, because they will kill not only the aphids, and they're good at that, but they will kill the ladybugs and the surfed flies and the wasps. So give the beneficials a chance, but help them out by knocking the aphids off and uh, keep after it. Uh, Jan Parcell writes, um, what about that smothering oil they spray apple blossoms with? I get many worms in all my apples. Yeah. If you have apples um, or pears in this county, in Contra Costa County, well, any county around here, you're going to have the coddling moth. That's what the worm is in your apple. It's a little moth. Uh, they're about a quarter inch long, uh, half inch long maybe. They come out at night when the temperature is over 65 degrees and they lay their eggs on twigs or leaves or on the apple itself. And the way you know you have it is you see a little brown substance on the little apple, it's called frass. It's, it's worm poop is what it is. And the worm is down in the apple. Now you can spray all you want and it's not going to get to that worm because the worm is only vulnerable just before it burrows into the apple. So this comes to something that Joan talked about earlier, and that's a tolerance level. If, if how many wormy apples can you accept? Um, I have uh, four apple trees on my property and I have a coddling moth. And maybe I have 50% of the apples that have a worm in them but I have 50% that don't. And also the 50% that have the worm 
if you can cut the worm out of there, uh, some people are horrified by the thought, there's nothing wrong with that apple. You could make applesauce out of it or dry it. You just cut the worm out and get rid of it. You can spray for them. You can spray uh, the oil. It would be, I, I'm not exactly familiar what oil you're talking about. Probably a neem oil type thing, like I mentioned before, to suffocate the aphids. There is that I mentioned uh, uh, spinosad or spinosad is, is used uh, uh, for, for apples. Uh, it'll kill the larva. But spinosad sprays, while they're very safe in some ways, they're specific for caterpillars. They can kill honeybees. So you got to be careful with it. But in order to spray apples, you have to be very persistent. It's costly. It's time consuming. And it, it, there's actual formulas of, of degree days. It has to be a certain number of days above a certain temperature to spray, to have your best chance of getting the uh, worms or the larva before they crawl in the apple. Do you really want to do that? It's doable, but it's difficult. Um, I would say that if, unless you're losing every single apple to the worm, you could probably live with it. And um, that's, that's what I do. And that's what I would say, just what's your tolerance level? You know, if you get enough apples for, to eat, uh, to make your applesauce or whatever you do, then I wouldn't worry as much about it because it's very difficult to combat that one. You notice the, excuse me, one more thing. You notice when you go to the market, the apples are perfect. Well, they've been sprayed a lot. I don't know with what, but multiple, uh, multiple uh, pesticides in order to do that because coddling moth is everywhere. So this is a balance you have to, you have to come up with uh, and accept one way or the other for yourself. Yeah, I have an apple tree in my yard and got coddling moth for the first time last year. And I looked at the chart on when to spray and uh, doing the temperature and has to be this for so many days. And, this, and it involved doing math. And I said, I'll live with the moth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Arlene asked, can I ethically remove a squirrel nest from my tree? Uh, you can, but you shouldn't do it now because it is um, uh, nesting season and you're, there's probably babies there. Um, so you, you need to wait to remove any nests until you're sure that they aren't being used. And for uh, tree squirrels, well, for birds too, you really don't want to do any pruning or nest removal until like around November um, into January, maybe. So. Just keep an eye on it and uh, you'll get to it eventually. Uh, Diane Rames asks, uh, how can we attract more native bees and dragonflies? Flowers. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that sounds trite, but, but it's true. The, uh, for the native bees, there's a lot of them out there. Um, you want a variety of, of flowers that bloom through throughout the season. You want uh, herbs. Herbs have wonderful, uh, are uh, great drawers of, of bees, lavenders. Um, I'm finding them on everything this year. I have cacti that are blooming right now that are just covered with carpenter bees and, and uh, other bumblebees. So I think in a general sense, you can go online actually and look at which, but I, I think almost any flower that you can put in your yard that you would like is going to draw in, in the bees. The dragonflies, I don't know. Dragonflies, I'd have to pass on that because I actually don't know what draws dragonflies. They like water, uh, but yeah. I don't know. Uh, Joan, maybe you know. Yeah, right? you have a better chance of having dragonflies in your yard if you live fairly close to a, a water source, a pond even, or a stream. Uh, because they do, uh, they breed, I think. Well, they eat, they eat mosquitoes too. They're very they, good mosquitoes. They, and damselflies will eat mosquitoes. So that's why you see them around water because they're looking for the mosquito larvae to eat. And the other thing about native bees is a lot of them nest in the ground. And if, you're, if your entire yard is like mulched, they can't access that ground. So you want to leave an area open for them, or even if you just have some um, large, empty flower pots, you can uh, put 
put native soil in them and uh, they can use the. Um, looking here for, oh, I, there was a question from someone who said that was earlier and she said she needed to leave soon so she probably is not still on, but she talked asked about how to control carpenter bees. Um, a friend of hers has them and is upset with them um, drilling into the uh, deck, I think, but anyway, some wood around her house. So um, she asked if carpenter bees are beneficial and yes, they are. And most carpenter bees, I believe, only um, drill into wood that is um, like has wood rot or softer uh, wood. So probably painting over the area with some sort of sealant or paint would stop them from burrowing into the wood. Um, John, what yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. They they go in untreated uh, wood, and uh, I don't know. To me, you would have to have an awful lot of carpenter bees, I think, to to cause a problem to take your deck collapse or something. But but if they they drill holes and lay their eggs in there, and uh, you can plug the holes. Um, but the best bet is just to treat it with paint or some oil or something, and they won't go into it. Yeah. yeah. And we want to do anything we can to keep bees happy because yes. they're <laughs> without really, bees, we do not have food. <laughs> and they're really good pollinators. I mean, the uh, the carpenter bees are just amazing this year and they're beautiful to watch. And if you've ever seen a valley carpenter bee, it's the big uh, hairy uh, teddy bear. Golden. golden they're teddy bear, gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. They're a great one. Yeah. Um, Susan asked if it's legal to transport an animal to a wildlife rescue, uh, for example, a hurt raccoon or a skunk. Yes, that's that's legal uh, and very kind of you to do, <laughs> especially the skunk. But um, yeah, it's okay to transport them to somewhere for care. I, I'm not positive, but I think that if when the animal is killed and able to return to the wild, that it's released again in your yard or where it was mm -hmm. broken. So that's fine. Um, best spray for white flies on roses. Um, I think, isn't there a problem with using pesticides on white flies? Doesn't that actually make them worse? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that, that uh, because I've had the problem with them over the years and I've tried everything including things that I wouldn't use now, and it's almost ineffective against them. White flies are one of those things that um, your best bet is to let the beneficials handle them, and it doesn't always work because they're so bad. Sometimes, depending on what they're on, if they're on your roses, I'm not, but if they're on your be beans or something, sometimes you just have to yank it up and throw it in a green can or something. Um, it is very, very hard to deal with. I tried, you could use oils on them and it would suffocate the, the nymphs. Um, uh, they're a, a, a bug and they, they, uh, their babies are called nymphs and they are on the underside of leaves and they're sucking the juice out of the plant. If you spray the nymphs, they'll suffocate, but the adults will fly away and they'll just lay more eggs. They're a very difficult um, uh, critter to get rid of. I've had them so bad that I gave up and uh, a few weeks later they were gone. And I, to this day, I don't know what to take them, but believe it or not, our friends, the pesky uh, yellow jacket, which drives us crazy in August when we have a barbecue, they're, they eat white fly nymphs and they eat caterpillars. So they have some positive attributes too. So there are, there are things out there that will eat the white flies, but um, I share uh, the frustration that uh, I've never really had them on roses so much, but I have them on other things. And uh, just, uh, you gotta be careful spraying oils too much also. Oils can be really effective for a lot of things, can actually suffocate mildew that you get on roses. But if you spray oils too much uh, and it gets too hot, you'll burn your plants. Um, so you gotta be careful with, with those types of things. Um, 
I, I, you know what I would encourage you, since I can't give you a, a definite answer, I would encourage you to look at the, uh, the UCIPM um, pest note on white flies. It's going to give you better information. I think it's going to give you what I gave you, but it's going to be better at it and give you more uh, um, uh, information. I think we're going to have that, uh, that uh, website to the IPM is going to be available through a handout that we, we have. So I encourage you to go uh, and look at that because it would probably be better information than I gave you. It looks like we have time for a couple more questions. And I did want to let people know that I, I'll be collecting all of the questions and or hopefully somebody will do that for me. And I'll uh, be writing a story that tries to answer the ones that we didn't get to today. But um, there's an observation here from Diane who says, I put Vaseline on the trunk of my peach tree to keep the ants and aphids off the tree. Uh, Vaseline or um, Tanglefoot, which is a commercial product that's very sticky. Um, the only qualm that I have with using any of those things is that you wanna be careful that uh, the birds don't get into it. Um, Vaseline, is really bad if it gets on, especially hummingbird wings. Uh, it can prevent them from flying. Birds' feathers are very intricately uh, layered and arranged, and that's why they spend a lot of time preening. Uh, it also protects them from uh, cold and somewhat from the heat also. So just be careful with doing that. Uh, the tanglefoot is like extremely sticky and um, it can catch lizards and other creatures too. That was just a little warning for me. Uh, Anne asked, how do you best recommend keeping deer away? I plant all deer resistant plants. And you may have noticed that during drought times, there is no such thing as a deer resistant plant. Uh, if deer are hungry, they will eat anything. Um, I, I don't have deer around me. Um, which is kind of a good thing, bad thing. I, I, they're really beautiful to watch. But um, what I've heard works the best is a spray that's made from eggs. Um, and I don't know the exact formula, but if you Google it, or I'll put, I'll have it in the story. Um, you, you mix it up. I think you leave it in the refrigerator overnight. You spray it on your roses early in the morning. There's something about the smell of the egg that deer do not like. And mm -hmm. you may smell it too, like the first day, but then <clears throat> it dissipates, but the deer still smell it. So that, that helps to keep them away. Uh, you have to do repeat springs, obviously. Um, an eight foot fence will keep them away, but not too many people want an eight foot fence in the front yard where most of the time our roses are. Uh, but if you string a uh, just a filament, like a fishing line, um, six to eight feet at, or above your existing, if you have a small fence, um, they can't figure it out. They can see it, but they don't know what it is. And so they don't usually don't risk jumping over it to get to your roses. Hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, John? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know about that. That fishing line. That's an interesting one. No, I had never heard that one. I don't know how how successful it is, but apparently it's it's worked well enough that people suggest it. So. Well, uh, Joan, one thing before we go about the tanglefoot thing that the lady asked mm -hmm. about the Vaseline. If you use that approach, and it is effective against things, don't put it directly onto the tree. Yeah. You put paper or something tightly. And that, of course, is a challenge if the tree is not perfectly smooth, because if there's a little gap, an ant can get under it. But you don't want to put tanglefoot or Vaseline directly on the, the bark, because it can it could be a bad thing for, for the tree. So you, you want to put a, a, a band of a paper band or tape or something around there to smear it on there, uh, to smear the tanglefoot on. And always use gloves when you use Tanglefoot. If you ever get it on you, it's hard to get off. Yeah. So we'll do one last one. And this is a mystery question for you, John. Uh -oh. My red 
rosebud bush and my lilac are infested with something. The leaves have large and small circular patches chewed away. Any idea of what it is and what I can do about it? That's, you know, that, that question is often, uh, is a very common question of, of that you see something chewed and they go, well, what can I do to get rid of it? Without seeing what it is, it's almost impossible to say how to get, uh, you know, what the proper approach is. So what you look at, what could it be? Uh, and what could it not be? It's, it's, it's not a snail or a slug, presumably, because it's way up high and it's circular and you don't see slug trails and so forth. It could be a beetle. It could be a bird, surprisingly. Birds can cause, uh, can punch holes or eat ragged edges around there. It could be a whole variety of insects. So it's really difficult until we know exactly what it is. We can't really give you a strategy to get rid of it. The question you have to ask, I guess, is, well, how much of a problem is it? Is it just a cosmetic issue that, you know, you have some bad looking leaves or is it is the tree being decimated by it? Uh, do you see shiny, sticky substance on the leaves, which could indicate a sucking insect like an aphid or a scale or a mealybug or something? Are there ants associated with the, the damage? Because ants like to farm the honeydew, the sticky stuff that aphids and scale produce. So you could have to look at, we need more information to be able to maybe zero in on what it could be. Because probably most likely we can tell you what it is not. Like if you don't see the honeydew, the slick, sticky stuff, you don't see the ants associated with it, you say, well, it's not a sucking insect. Um, it's not a scale, it's not an aphid, it's not uh, some of those. But you can't really say that it's a beetle or a grasshopper or what kind of beetle it is. And even if you knew, what would you do about it? Because you're not going to spray, even if you chose to spray, if the thing, if the creature is not there, you're not going to have any effect on it. And you don't want to use something systemic into the plant because then a lot of things could uh, be damaged. So it's a, it's a long answer to say, we don't know exactly what it is. We need more information, but if it's mainly cosmetic, that it, you just don't like the look of chewed leaves, but there's not every leaf in the tree, then I would just accept it and move on because it's gonna be frustrating to try to figure out if you can't see which one it is, if you could see it, then we can say, okay, this is the approach you take to get rid of it. Yeah, I might add that something you may not consider is to look under the leaf and you might see the insect that's there. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them that's they feed from underneath yeah. or they hang out underneath. And uh, before the pandemic, the master gardeners had uh, the Ask a Master Gardener desk at um, farmers markets and at our garden. And then the pandemic, I think, put an end to those. But can you still like call the Master Gardener helpline or submit photos? Um, there's a yes and a no there. You, since there, there's nobody manning the phones now because we can't go in the office, but there is an email and it's on that, uh, uh, that pamphlet that that uh, I submitted. Um, yeah, you'll be you'll be getting that mailed to you tomorrow. Yes, and there is the email address. And what you can do to that with the help desk is you take pictures and you give as much information as you can, and they will do. They'll help you out and give you some advice on what it could be. But you need to provide as much information as you do. Things like I ask you: Is it all over the tree? Is it just a little bit on the tree? Is there you know, sticky stuff, are there ants, uh, pictures, of course, visualization is, is worth a, a, a million words. So, uh, but yes, that help desk, uh, there are very competent people that, uh, that can help uh, answer your question. And I just found out yesterday that we are going to be, able, it looks like, it's not an absolute, that we're going to be able to uh, be at farmer's markets again this summer pretty soon, but not in the way we were before, but we will have people there to answer questions is the point. So that's right. good news. Well, thanks for joining me here today, John. You've been a, a huge source of information and entertainment.
<laughs> and uh, I want to thank everyone who, who uh, came today to, to participate and to listen. Hopefully we gave you some valuable information and um, we look forward to seeing you on the next one. And I'll turn it back to Aaron. Awesome. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, everyone who has joined today. We really appreciate you participating in our webinars. Um, we wanted to let you know of our future ones, right? So we have our next one coming up on May 27th. Uh, similar vein to this, it's peaceful coexistence with wildlife. So um, not very specific on the garden part of it, but more um, your everyday life and, and kind of your uh, you know household and, and backyard as a whole um, versus specific to plants or flowers. So we hope you join for that. Uh, and then on July 15th, we'll be doing gardening, what went wrong? I'm sure everybody's had that question. Um, so please register at mercurynews.com slash events, eastbaytimes.com slash events, or at marinij.com slash events.